Matthew 11:12 is one of the more difficult verses in the Bible. So I had to petition the Holy Spirit to reveal to me the meaning of this verse, and he did. But the awesome thing is, when you go to the early Christians and see what they believed about this verse, it's the same thing that the Holy Spirit revealed to me as the meaning of this verse. And not that we hold the early Christians up on some kind of pedestal and we we view them as some kind of authority over us or on the same level of scripture or anything like that. But it's just that additional verification, if you will. The verse reads, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So what exactly does this mean? Because Jesus preached nonviolence. So what does this talk about violence that Jesus is saying here? I thought we were supposed to be nonviolent. And not only that, but it says that the violent take it. As Christians, we're not supposed to be taking anything. We're not supposed to be stealing or taking. And not only that, but we're not supposed to be taking it by force. We're supposed to be gentle and meek and humble. So what is this talking about? Well, it says that the violent take it by force. What is it? Well, if we just look back, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. The violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. This may sound odd to many people, but as we're going to see, Scripture talks about this, about, about striving to lay hold of eternal life as we're going to go through here in just a minute. But really, the key to this is what does violence mean here? If, if it doesn't mean physical violence, then what does it mean? Well, just like in John 6, his disciples didn't understand him when he was talking about that they would have to eat of him and drink his blood. They would have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they misunderstood him. They thought that they were actually literally going to have to eat his blood right there and, and I guess, hack him up and eat his flesh. And they said, this is a hard saying. Who, 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 can, who can understand this? Who can bear this? And they left. Well, just like that, people aren't understanding that there's a spiritual element here. This is talking about spiritual violence, not literal physical violence. This is talking about we are to be violent in the sense that we're to let nothing stop us from laying hold of the kingdom of heaven. We're to let nothing get in the way. We're to have this resolve in our mind, this, this endurance and this, this mentality that we're going to conquer no matter what. We're going to overcome any obstacles that come our way. We're going to defeat the, the, the powers of the enemy no matter what the cost. And we're going to lay everything to the side if we need to and violently take hold of the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus is talking about here. But let's look and see how the early Christians viewed this verse. Irenaeus says, The Lord declared that the kingdom of heaven was the portion of the violent. He says, The violent take it by force. By the violent, he means, those who by strength and earnest striving are on the watch to snatch it away on the moment. This able wrestler, therefore, exhorts us to enter the struggle for immortality. A lot of people might think this sounds kind of foreign, but like I said, as I'm going to show, this is what scripture talks about. Struggling and striving like Irenaeus is talking about in order to have eternal life. He goes on. He says, he does this so that we may be crowned and so we may deem the crown precious for it is that which is acquired by our struggle. Since then, this power has been conferred upon us. The Lord has taught and the apostle has commanded us even more to love God so that we may reach this for ourselves by striving after it. So Irenaeus saw that violence here means that we have this strength in this earnest striving and this struggling in order to have immortality. Uh, Clement of Alexandria about this verse, he says, The violent who storm the kingdom are not persons who are argumentative in speeches. Rather, they are said to take it by force because they continue in a right life and in unceasing prayers. They thereby wipe away the blots left by their previous sins. 
So he believed that it was continuing in right life, continuing in holiness, enduring in, in living a right life and in unceasing prayers. This is how we violently storm the kingdom, by not stopping praying and by living right. Uh, he also says of this verse, the kingdom belongs preeminently to the violent. They reap this fruit from investigation, study, and discipline so that they may become kings. So this is, this is talking about that we're to study to show ourselves approved, right? We're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So this is how he's saying that, that to be violent means we're pursuing God with everything. We're pursuing God with all of our intellect, we're, we're, we're seeking to know him, just like Jesus said, that, that this eternal life, that, they, that we know him, right? And he also says of this verse, the kingdom of heaven does not belong to sleepers and sluggards. Rather, the violent take it by force. For this alone is commendable violence, to struggle with God and to take life from God by force. Again, this to us may sound foreign, but as I'm going to show, this is absolutely reiterated in scripture. And he knows those who persevere firmly or rather violently, and he yields and grants for God delights in being conquered in such things. So he not only sees it as investigation and study and, and loving God with our mind, but also struggling with God to take life and, and persevering. It's, it's this, the early Christians saw this verse to mean uh, enduring and persevering and pursuing God with all we have, right? And lastly, Tertullian says, offering up prayer to God as with united force, we wrestle with him in, in our supplications. God delights in this violence. So, Supplication is like this earnest begging. It's this praying to God. It's crying out to him. It's begging him. And he says that it's in this wrestling with him, in our, in our begging to God, that God delights in this, in this sort of violence, violently pursuing him in prayer and wrestling with him. And like I said, this is all throughout scripture. Jesus himself said, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Why does he say to strive? Well, because many are going to be trying to enter. This isn't talking about Muslims or atheists. This is talking about people who are actually trying to enter heaven. Many Christians, like he said, you know, on that day, he'll tell many, depart from me, I never knew you. Many are trying to enter the kingdom of heaven. They're, they may be sincere and they're trying, but they're not going to make it. That's what he's saying here. Why? Because they're not striving. Many Christians don't even know that they're supposed to be striving. They don't even know that they're supposed to have this violent resolve to pursue God above all else, to forsake everything they have and to pursue him with all that they have and to keep doing this, to endure in this, to, to cry out to God. This is why many Christians are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is, why the, this is why you'll see many who are trying, but they won't make it because they're not striving. They don't even know they're supposed to strive. Like Paul tells Timothy, we're to fight the good fight of faith. And, and it's a fight, friends. It, it, it's a fight of the mind. It's a fight of the will and it's a fight of the mind. It's, it, it's a fight against false doctrine. There's so many false doctrines that come in and try to choke us out and try to lead us astray. And, and it's a fight of our own will to not let pride get in the way and so many temptations get in the way. This is a fight. And he says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul is saying that, Timothy, you've made the confession of Christ. Just like in Romans 10, about confessing Christ. You've already done that. You've already done that. But now take hold of eternal life. Well, why is he needing to take hold of eternal life if he, if he already has it and, and that's all that you need to do is just to obtain it and then you're done. You're good to go. No, he's telling Timothy. He, he's exhorting him to make sure that he takes hold of eternal life and fight the good fight of faith. 
Like it says in Hebrews, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Why? So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. All throughout scripture, we're commanded to endure, to persevere, to continue in the faith, to strive. This is all throughout scripture, friends. And then, of course, Jesus says in Mark 13, 13, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, listen, there's two major pitfalls that I see. And there's more, but these are two in particular that I want to talk about today. The first one is, like I, like I already mentioned, the first category of Christians that don't even know that they're supposed to be striving, so they're not even striving. Okay, they're, they're, they're living a very, they're, they're not being violent, trying to violently take hold of the kingdom. They're just kind of going on about their, about their life. They don't even know they're supposed to be striving. But there's the second group of Christians, those who are actually walking the narrow path, who are actually living holy, and yet they will not endure to the end. They will not persevere. This is why Jesus said, to the apostles, he warned them, said, the one who endures to the end will be saved. He told this to his apostles. There's a big risk out there, guys. There's a big risk of even you who are living a holy life right now and, and who have forsaken their sin and, and, are, and are in the will of God. There's, there's still a big warning to you guys. The sad thing is many of you will still not make it. There, there's so many things that I've seen come in. There's, there's false doctrines that come in and just it just leads. I've seen it. I've, I've seen people be on fire for the Lord, be living holy lives. And all of a sudden, this false doctrine comes in and, and they follow after it. And they follow it after to condemnation or they let pride slip in. The, the devil's got many different tactics that he can use. And, and if we follow those, if we fall into those and are lured away by those, we can fall into the same condemnation of the devil. This, this is a big warning. And listen, all throughout scripture, there are real warnings to those who are actually living holy and, and pursuing God with all they have to keep enduring and to not fall away. If we just look at Paul, when he writes to the Galatians, he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And then we know the story that they fell away from Christ, that Christ was no longer of any advantage to them. They'd been severed from Christ. And he says, but yet they were running well. They, they were not, listen, he didn't just say that you guys were walking well. You were, you were doing okay. No, he said that you were running well. And friends, my fear today is that there are many of you out there that, that are running well, but that will not continue on the narrow path. These Galatians, they were running well. They were running the race. They were pursuing God with, with all they had, right? They were in the race, but they fell away. And if we just look at the seven churches that Jesus addressed in Revelation chapters two and three, like I said in my other video, that there were five churches that Jesus rebuked, that he had words of rebuke for, but there were two churches that he did not have any words of rebuke for. But let's look and see what he told them. These are strong Christians that, again, Jesus did not rebuke them for anything. But he did warn them. And what I want to look at is what did he warn them? What did he tell Christians who, who were on the narrow path? What words did he have for them? Because this is, this is directed to you. You who are on the narrow path right now, who, who have forsaken their sin and are really serving God and are in the will of God right now. This is to you. This is to you. Listen, again, these are to, this is to the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia where he had nothing to rebuke them on. But he still tells them this. In Revelation 2, he says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. But, listen to this, be faithful unto death. He warns them 
even though that they were already on the narrow path, be faithful unto death. See, most, most people would say, well, hey, I've already arrived, you know, I'm, I'm already saved, I'm already on the narrow path, so I can kind of kind of relax. Well, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say, hey, hey, listen, just relax. You're good now. I don't have anything to rebuke you. You're doing everything that's right. Just, you know, you can relax now. No, he doesn't say that. Listen to what he actually tells them because this is applicable to you who were on the narrow path. He warns them, he says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is salvation. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me ask you, if they were not faithful unto death, would he have given them the crown of life? No. And then he goes on. He says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. He warns them that, hey, listen, you still need to conquer in order to inherit salvation, in order to not be hurt by the second death. You need to conquer. You who are running well, are, are doing good, are on the narrow path, you need to continue to be faithful and you need to conquer. And listen, the other church in Philadelphia, he says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. So this tells us that even though he had nothing to rebuke him on, again, that somebody could still seize their crown. That was a very real threat for him to, for him to say this, for him to warn them that they need to hold fast to what they have so that no one may seize their crown. The one who conquers, see, he warns them again about conquering. He tells them the necessity to conquer, even though they're already on the narrow path. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. If we just look at Paul, Paul, I mean, look, look at him. One of the greatest Christians that ever lived. And yet he said that he himself could go to hell. He himself could become disqualified after preaching to others. After all that he'd done, he says that he could become disqualified. This word here means reprobate, cast away. That's what he says. And, and right before that, he's talking about, listen, I'm running a race here. And he's exhorting us to run a race as well so that we may win the prize. A lot of people don't even know they're supposed to be running a race. They think that, well, oh yeah, that's, that's for that super Christian out there. That, that's for that one that wants to go the extra mile and, and maybe get a couple extra rewards in heaven. Friends, this is foolishness. No. This is talking about salvation. You run the race to win first prize. Why? For salvation's sake. That's what Paul says, so that he himself doesn't get disqualified. He, he disciplines his body, he says, and keeps it under control. He does not run aimlessly. He does not box as one beating the air. Why? Because he's trying to, to win the prize, not a perishable wreath, but an imperishable wreath. Again, this is talking about salvation. Just like Jesus said, the crown of life, that's salvation. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. The question is, are, are you above Paul? So if you say that you've arrived at a place where you can't fall, even though, look at Romans 11, he warns them there as well. Hey, listen, you could fall due to pride. Humble yourself. But if, if you think that you've arrived at this place where you don't need to any longer continue to strive and endure, then let me ask you, are you better than Paul. Are you better than Paul who said that he, even he himself could become a reprobate, a castaway? Or are you better than Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, the, the same Peter who walked on water? He was in the inner circle, some people say. And Jesus still warns Peter that even he could go to hell. In Luke 12, after Jesus was preaching, Peter seemed alarmed and he, and he said to him, he said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us? You know, like for us apostles, disciples, are you telling this parable for us or for all? 
are you warning us or is this just for all those other people? And Jesus answers him. He, he, he says, who do you think I'm talking about? Who, who do you think is the wise and faithful manager? And he says, but if that servant, well, what servant? He's talking about Peter in the context. If you look at the context, the servant here, he's talking about Peter. Listen, if you, Peter, say to yourself, my master is delayed in coming and begin to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. This he told to Peter that he would cut Peter into pieces and put him with the unfaithful if he ever turned aside and started doing evil. And this is why Peter, if you look at his writings, he said that God judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Why? Because he knew, he knew after Jesus warned him that even he could be cut to pieces and thrown with the unfaithful. He knew that, listen, God is not, God does not show partiality. God judges each man according to his deeds, he says. And he says, therefore, we're to fear. We're to fear God. This is why Paul tells Timothy, he says that we're to train ourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. See, again, he's using this whole idea of running a race, of, of training yourself. If you just think of any athlete, let's say a marathon runner or just really any athlete, they have this mentality that they're going to stop at nothing. They're going to win first prize. They, they, don't, they don't run thinking, yeah, as long as I come in, you know, like in, in the top 100, I think I'm okay. No, no, friends. That's the wrong mentality. Only the violent take it by force. Jesus said that many will try to enter, but only few are going to make it. That's why we have to have this violent mentality that we're going to stop at nothing. We're going to let nothing get in the way and stop us from achieving our goal just like just like an athlete he's not letting anything get in his way he's going to achieve his goal he's going to do everything he can to win first prize this is what paul says that we're all to do this isn't just for special christians this is so that we don't become a reprobate or a castaway we're to run this race he uses this analogy of a race all throughout the new testament and he says bodily training is of some value just like, just like training yourself in a marathon race. Yeah, that, that has some value. But godliness is a value in every way as, as it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That's talking about salvation. This is a salvific issue. And he says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So yes, God helps us. God equips us. He's a good coach. He trains us. He teaches us. He guides us. He equips us. He gives us what we need. But friends, we still have to show up. We still have to do the training. We still have to put in the effort. Do you, do you think that it's easy for, he used the analogy of, of athletes running to win first place. Do you think that it's easy for them to train, to wake up in the morning and to make sure they eat right and to run you know, dozens of miles? Do you think that that's easy for them to do day after day after day and not give up, to keep enduring? Well, he says, just like that, that has some value, but let me tell you what really has value. Godliness holds the promise for this present life and also for the life to come. This is the mentality that we're supposed to have. This is not easy. This is why we're told so many times in the Bible to strive to enter, to persevere, to endure to the end. We don't just say, oh, hey, I don't do the same things that I used to. I don't um, look at porn and I stopped doing drugs and all this. And so everything's okay now. No, no, we don't say that. We continue striving all the way to the end. We don't stop. We don't stop just like these athletes. They don't, they don't stop. They don't get to a point where they're like, okay, I'm good now. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good. No, because the next person next to them is going to keep training. They're not going to stop. And they're going to beat you. 
So he says, this is the mentality that we need to have. Like again, right here, he talks about us being soldiers for Christ. Being a soldier is not easy. And it's not easy, likewise, in the kingdom of God. We have to endure suffering. We have to endure trials. We have to endure. He says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Again, here's this analogy. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. What's he talking about? Unless he continues to live a life of holiness and does what God tells him to do. Or else he'll be disqualified, like he said. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So a lot of people think that being fruitful just means, well, just having the fruit of the Spirit and, and not sinning. So, okay, yeah, they say, I've arrived. And then they think that that's all fruitfulness is. But no, fruitfulness is also bringing people to Christ. This is why Paul continued striving. So even if you're not, even if you've conquered major sins in your life, there's still this striving to bring people into the kingdom, to bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold, right? The Bible doesn't say in the parable of the four soils. It doesn't say to bear fruit one or two or three fold. No, it says 30, 60, 100 fold. We're to bear lots of fruit, Okay. It says, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. It's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. This is the mentality that we're supposed to have. Like an athlete, like a soldier. Soldiers don't stop at anything to uh, secure the mission, to complete the mission. This is what Paul is saying. That we're to endure sufferings, endure whatever we need to. Forsake whatever we need to. Let nothing get in the way in order to accomplish the goal. And the goal, like he said to Timothy, is laying hold of eternal life. This is why we're to put, the, put on the armor of God. So why? So it says, to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Because listen, it's, it's a battle of the mind. The, the devil's coming after us. The schemes of the devil are trying to trick us and lead us astray. This is why it's a fight that's why he told Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. We're, we're, not, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. There's so many Christians out there, I believe, that think that they've gotten to a place where they're good. But friends, if Paul said that he, that he was not home yet and that he could still be disqualified and Peter was warned that even he could go to hell, then are, you're not above them. You're not better than them. No, we have to, we have to put on the armor of God and continue to fight so that we can stand firm. And this is why the apostles, they went around preaching, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. There's many things that are going to come up. There's many things that we have to, to fight and wrestle with and, and struggle with in order to be saved. This is, why, this is why they encouraged them to continue in the faith. This they were saying to disciples and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many sufferings and through many trials, we must violently take hold of eternal life. We must violently take the kingdom of heaven. And as James says, blessed is the man who, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Here's that crown being talked about again, which God has promised to those who love him. See, we have to continue to endure. Those of you out there who think that, that you're good, no, just like Jesus said to the churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia, they had to continue to be faithful. They had to continue to conquer. Just like James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. This is salvation, guys. 
And lastly here in Hebrews 10, he says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So those of you who are confident out there, who are saying that, you know, you, that, that you're good to go, he warns them, he says, do not throw away your confidence. Why? Because it has great reward. You have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. This is to, again, talking about salvation. Now, friends, have you done all of the will of God yet? No, there's still more to be done. There's still more people to bring in, to bring to Christ. There's still more that we can grow to be like Jesus. There's still more that we can grow in love. So we have not done all the will of God. So this is why he says that we are in need of endurance. We can't throw away this confidence. We can't just say that we don't, we don't have need of endurance. We don't need to continue striving to enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul told Timothy after he'd already made the confession and he was already, quote, a strong Christian, that he still needed to take hold of eternal life. So friends, that's what I wanted to exhort you guys today to not throw away your confidence, to continue to endure to the end, to violently take hold of the kingdom of heaven, to let nothing stand your way, let nothing stop you, let nothing come between you and God as an idol, no matter what it is, to forsake everything if, if, if you need to, to follow Jesus. That's the only way, guys. That's the only way to salvation. And this is only for the violent. This is only for those who have this mentality, like a soldier, like an athlete, who, who, who's going to stop at nothing to accomplish the mission to win first prize. Is this you, friends? Because if it's not you, then you won't make it. You're going to be among those people who Jesus said, strive to enter the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter, but won't make it. Don't be one of those ones who's seeking to enter, who, who's, who's, you know, trying some, but, but not striving violently. We're to strive spiritually to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's all I got for today. Guys, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the thumbs up. Comment below. It helps the algorithm. It helps get this message out there to more and more people. Anytime you comment, anytime you hit the thumbs up, it helps spread the message and it helps the algorithm for this to, for this to go further. So thank you guys for everything. That's all I got. God bless.